Okay, hey, this is a uh, short video that I'm making here today, uh, just trying to um, talk a little bit to you in addition to the uh, announcement that I made. Uh, important information up here today, we're talking about the Plata case. Um, case has been variously called Schwarzenegger versus Plata or Brown versus Plata. Uh, Schwarzenegger obviously was the governor of California uh, and also then Jerry Brown was also the governor of California. Uh, the problem with this is a case about overcrowding. An unprecedented number of people were supposed to be released from prison because over a period of long period of years, 20 years, um, the state of California had made very poor progress in uh, reducing overcrowding in the prisons. And so at some point, uh, the decision was made by a three-judge panel, lower-level court, that was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court that uh, this huge number of um, defendants, inmates, uh, which we're talking uh, 25,000 up to 40,000, depending uh, on certain circumstances, but this large number of inmates were to be released from prison. And of course, the state rushed to appeal that decision and are saying, you know, this is unprecedented, uh, uh, it's going to affect uh, law enforcement, uh, safety in the state of California if you just out of hand release. Um, this, you know, thousands of criminal defendants from prison. Uh, but um, <clears throat> in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court said, well, we, you've given us no choice. You know, don't blame the Supreme Court, blame the California state legislature because they did not approve funding uh, to, you know, to come up with any uh, alternatives or, or other choices. Um, you know, obviously this is a very stark kind of a case uh, to have to consider, but it is, um, you know, something when you look at it in terms of the needs of prisoners, as far as their physical needs, their health needs, uh, you know, a safe place for them to sleep. Uh, uh, basically, I was in a prison one time called Wabash Correctional, and they had actually converted the cafeteria uh, into more a, a giant bedroom. And I was scared to death just to walk through there uh, to get to an office that I needed to go to because you could be stabbed easily, uh, you know, a third of the way through that room full of people before anyone could get to you uh, to try to protect you. So it's a very dangerous type of a setting when you're dealing with overcrowding. The other part of it, of course, is that, you know, mostly this chapter is about basically risk and needs assessment of each offender. And the thing that we need to look at is uh, this is in a broad sense. Uh, yes, okay, we have some very violent offenders, but we also have some thieves and uh, burglars and uh, basically fraud type people that take advantage of other people uh, without using much physical exertion, uh, bad checks, things like that. And some of these people are in wheelchairs. I mean, seriously. I mean, these people have physical... Uh, problems, they need uh, health care, they need to see a doctor regularly, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart problems. I mean, we can go on and on, and this is all supposed to be part of the uh, risk and needs assessment of every offender. And, you know, basically if you take someone like this in, then you are responsible for them. So this is a really big issue, a big problem for jails, because um, you know, to have a medical uh, staff person on uh, call uh, at any time is, is a very costly proposition. Uh, and then to even get like a nurse to agree to come to work in the jail, uh, that's not probably your favorite place for a nurse to work. Uh, cases that I've seen and uh, where I was involved as a volunteer was uh, in an internship 
Uh, and they had a basically a male paramedic that was serving as a male nurse uh, in in a good sized jail. And the main thing that we did was we we gave out medications. Uh, so in other words, the whole thing was overseen by a doctor, but the doctor was there very rarely, uh, maybe once a month. But the uh, nurse uh, paramedic that we had was there every day. Uh, and so he would check on everybody's health concerns, blood pressures, uh, give them their uh, medication, make sure that they took it. That was a big issue is that if, you know, you had to make sure move their tongue around with a tongue depressor, make sure they weren't like hiding their drugs under their tongue so they could turn around and try to sell them uh, or trade them for other things uh, that were bad. Uh, and so there's a number of issues uh, in providing health care in, in this setting. Uh, and so as we, as we look at this, we've got to look at it on a large scale on, you know, uh, broadly in terms of whether we're talking about medical needs, uh, educational needs, psychological needs. Uh, I read a thing in the Department of Education in my adult education class that over 50% of uh, offenders in prison have reading difficulties to the point where uh, some cannot read and write at all. A very large uh, number percentage-wise, also larger than uh, normal. The other thing is, like we said, the psychological aspect, because we've done away with so many uh, mental hospitals, the um, prison has become, and the jail have become the mental hospital of choice uh, for police. They really don't have a choice. There's no real place to put uh, people with um, mental health problems. So a lot of them gravitate uh, into prison. And I think the number is probably around 40%, the last time I checked, of prisoners in prison have uh, mental health issues of some kind now. One thing I will say to you is about 60% of all the people in the country have depression problems. So, you know, we're talking about untreated depression. You know, are we talking about schizophrenia? Are we talking about um, really serious mental conditions? Are we talking about some milder, you know, anxiety, depression uh, kinds of things? Uh, and, you know, that's something that would need to be uh, visited in any kind of an intake process uh, that a person would have some kind of a mental health evaluation. So a really effective intake of people who are new inmates in prison uh, would require that they have a very thorough assessment of their not only risks, which means are they a risk of violence, could they hurt people? Uh, or an, another aspect is the needs assessment. So this is a twofold assessment. Are they going to hurt anybody? Or, um, you know, just what are their needs? Do they have mental health needs? Do they have educational needs? Do they have drug and alcohol problems? Uh, should they try to have treatment for these folks in terms of uh, their mental health issues? Now, one thing I would say, too, is that because of some of these very long sentences, especially for, like, dealing drugs and things like that, then you're having a number of people who are aging out uh, of the system. And what that means is that they're going to be in prison basically their whole life. Uh, let's face it, if you're, like, 30 years old and you get a 50-year sentence, then you're probably going to have to serve anywhere from 40 to 50 years, depending on good time, if they even have good time. So you're going to have a lot of 80-year-old people in prison. That's, that's going to be an issue. And the problem with that is that when you get to be 60, I can tell you that things start falling apart, and so you have problems with arthritis. You can't walk. You can't climb. So you need to be on a first-floor level as far as more of a nursing home type of uh, a prison and you know could you come up with a nursing home kind of a prison well there are people there's a lot of people in prison today 
uh, you know, that are having trouble walking, that are having trouble with their blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, you know, people lose limbs because of diabetes, lose their feet, lose their knees, lose their legs. I mean, they get to where they can't even walk, sorry to say. So um, this is all part of this assessment process and classification process. Another thing is that over time, offenders can be reclassified. So they may start out as some like young buck guy that's uh, uh, ripping and running in the streets and then he's there for 50 years. So in a period of time, he starts to lose his capabilities. He has medical problems. He has these psychological problems, a number of different things that can crop up while he's in prison. So, you know, people should be subject to reclassification every so many months or years to look at have they changed and, you know, would be would they be better off in a different type of a, a setting. So these are just different things that we're thinking about. Me, myself, uh, you may know by now that I'm a big proponent of community corrections. And so every so often, I think it would be wise to go through and like trim back the people that you have in prison. Are they nonviolent? You know, can we trust them back in society? Have they learned anything? Uh, and look at things like parole. So we could get an early release, put them in a less uh, confining type of a setting, a minimum release type, uh, minimum security uh, type of uh, sentence where they could be uh, in some kind of a community setting, maybe a group home, uh, and working their way toward, uh, you know, at home release where they would be on a form of parole or probation. Uh, so these are all considerations that we can look at. I truly believe that uh, over 50% of the people that are in prison today could be and really should be in some kind of a community corrections program whether it's in a group home or a live at home and attend services uh, for mental health, uh, education, substance abuse, uh, job skills training, these things that are all available in the community. Uh, a lot of people don't agree with that, but uh, I'm looking at it not just from the standpoint of the right thing to do as far as the risk and needs assessment for each individual offender, but I'm looking at it also as a friend to the taxpayer. Uh, there's no sense in spending thousands and thousands of dollars to keep somebody locked up when that money could be used for a lot of other things, including um, improving colleges, uh, improving education for little kids, um, help, help for the needy, help for the elderly. There's just a lot of different things. I'm not saying that the taxpayer is gonna get off the hook and not have to pay taxes. But what I am saying is, there's a lot of better ways to spend money than to spend it on keeping people locked up uh, behind bars. That's not to say that I don't think that the most violent offenders should indeed be in prison. I'm very strongly in favor of that. But I think we need to be a little more careful in deciding uh, who needs to be in prison. And I think that a lot of People with substance abuse problems, for example, might be good candidates to be involved in some kind of a community corrections program. Uh, I believe that's true of a number of others. Um, we'll talk some more about this. We'll talk about it in discussion this week. Feel free to um, share with us uh, and then uh, we'll work on forward uh, as we get more involved in uh, this topic. Always feel free to get in touch with me at p period daywall at snhu.edu uh, or in an emergency you can call me 765-506-7322. Thank you.